the Masai Mara Reserve in Kenya, one of the world's greatest theaters for wildlife with its ever-present actors, herbivores continuously on the move and stalking carnivores. This image of the African savanna immediately springs to mind. However, the following scenes will show that the lives of animals in the savanna cannot be summed up simply by the alternative eat or avoid being eaten. The sun is rising over the Maasai Mara, a shrubby savanna on the border with Tanzania, covering some 1,500 square kilometers. The reserve is famous for the great migration of wildebeest, fleeing the burning hot plains of Tanzania each year. In the foreground is a pride of lions led by this couple. Surrounding them are their usual neighbors, zebra, wildebeest, elephants, impalas, giraffes. Are they just minor actors? It might appear that way, but in fact their lives are more complex than appears. The mating of our stage animals, our actors, is in itself a play in several parts. The male lion has everything to boast about, a magnificent mane, a royal demeanor, and doe eyes to woo his partner. But she plays hard to get. That's her role. For the moment, the role of the male is to follow her, like her shadow. A lioness is on heat for four to six days. The prelude to mating lasts at least 24 hours. A cautious approach, a constant but discreet presence. Until she consents, the male has to display heroic patience. There are other males looking after the eight females and 12 cubs or so in this pride. However, only one male can aspire to mate with the lionesses. It's the dominant male, reduced for a few days to the state of a bashful lover. Why are there so many herbivores in the Maasai Mara? Because we are now in February, a time when the savanna offers a fresh and protein-rich pasture with young grasses sprouting two to three weeks after the rains. Wildebeest are prepared to travel 700 kilometers from the Serengeti Plains in the south so they can feast on them. Zebra also migrate along the same route on good terms with the wildebeest. Obviously, the lions pick their prize from these herds, or rather the lionesses do, since they are the ones hunting. There is no precedence among lionesses at their dinner table. Each one gulps down as much as she can. 
The cubs with baby teeth cannot bite into the flesh like the older ones can. They are only invited to the feast so that they are not left unattended. It's also a way of getting them familiar with the smell of blood to awaken their killer instinct. This female is the most experienced of the pride. She leads operations during the group hunt. Once she has eaten enough, she keeps a watch on the surroundings. Such a nice catch could attract a rival pride. If that were the case, watch out for the cubs. The adult females require about five kilograms of meat per day. The males, seven kilograms. The cubs live off their mother's milk for the first three months. Afterwards, they'll have a mixed diet, a little bit of meat in addition to the milk. Complete weaning occurs around six months. Walking for days and weeks to find the right plants is the fate of all herbivores on the Maasai Mara. Elephants choose to browse early in the morning to avoid the heat of the day. How boring for teenagers to walk for miles when playing is much more fun. The matriarch, an old and experienced female, systematically leads the group. She has a good memory and knows by heart the tracks leading to the most plentiful sites full of food. Every now and then, she tolerates a break. She knows the youngsters need to play fight to practice for real life battles they'll have as adults. But when she decides it's time to leave, everyone goes. Well, nearly everyone. Except for this calf, he couldn't wake up from his nap, so he had to be prodded a bit. stallion for several mares which remain loyal to him all their life. That sums up the small harems formed by Birchall's zebra. They live rather harmoniously except for the usual squabbles. This arrangement works well as long as these various families are not intruding on each other's territories. However, during the Great Migration, promiscuity leads to violent fights between stallions, especially if the migration coincides with the rutting season. Foals practice these equestrian wrestles from a young age. To challenge the chief of a harem, or if need be, to escape from a predator's claws, a well-placed kick can kill a lioness. With a head at more than five meters off the ground, it's easy to spot dangerous predators. It's one of the advantages of this unusual morphology. Another advantage is being able to browse the leaves at the top of trees like no other herbivore can. These two Maasai giraffes are rival males. 
They try to intimidate each other by rocking their necks, a strange behavior known as necking. As neither wants to give in, it will end up in blows. Oddly enough, the same movements, in a slower and softer way, are also used for courting. The Maasai giraffes live in small groups headed by a single male. The purpose of these duels, however violent they may be, is not to injure the rival, but to establish who is the strongest, which one, when the time comes, will take over as the head bull. Giraffes rarely eat grass because of the acrobatics required to do so, but sometimes the urge to graze on young tender grass shoots or to smell something on the ground is irresistible. Their anatomy can force them into some amazing positions. However, evolution has enabled them to do so safely. The blood vessels in a giraffe's head are equipped with valves preventing excessive blood flow to the brain. Throughout the day, groups of 30 to 40 females and calves travel in search of food. The giraffe's favorite plant, the acacia tree, it provides all the vitamins they require. The acacia is full of spines, but they don't care. Their mouth is totally impervious to thorns and their tongue flexible enough to grasp the leaves without being scratched. The herbivores of the Maasai Mara and other savannas live harmoniously together, generally having very different tastes. The grass in this clearing is the impala's favorite meal. The nicely ringed horns are the pride of the males and have the power of seduction which the females cannot resist. Why? Because the size of the horns is a reflection of the male's virility and the ladies only want the best partner for procreation. During the rutting season, the dominant ram establishes a vast territory. Females crossing this territory belong to him, and he chases away any male trying to approach them. It's an exhausting task, especially as these large harems with a hundred or more females attract many highly motivated rivals.
The day is getting hotter. The matriarch knew how to get the group to a shaded area where the best grass of the season grows. This convivial moment encourages contacts and exchanges. Elephants have an endearing way to greet each other or to show mutual affection. The trunk is such an extraordinary tool. It has more than 100,000 muscles, an ability to grasp, a very useful flexibility, and yet is sensitive enough to express feelings. During these breaks, the calves are constantly watched over. Those which are not old enough to graze take the opportunity to suckle some milk. They are allowed until they're three or four years old. The young impalas have to become independent much earlier in life. Fawns are only breastfed for five months. Afterwards, they have to graze like an adult. Moreover, they have to keep up with the moving herd. However, to establish their own territory, the young males will wait until they're four years old. This period is spent within the herd. Sometimes it's hard to hold back. The matriarch's daughter has just given birth. The calf is already on his feet, but not stable. And for quite a while, the mother and the other female assisting her will encourage the baby to stand up and start suckling. Come on, this is no time to give up. The newly born has to find his mother's teats as quickly as possible. Otherwise, he will perish. There might be several other females accompanying and helping the mother giving birth. 
First, they act as midwives, freeing the calf from the fetal membrane, which kept the newborn nice and warm for 22 months. Then they stay around the newborn until he has started suckling, which can sometimes take hours. But none of the elephants lose patience. He's done it. He can now excitedly suckle away and find the strength to live. The eldest female instinctively takes charge in maintaining and passing on the collective memory of the family. She knows where to find the best pastures and water holes. And under the midday sun, they've got to drink. These three sleepy hippos are not going to prevent them from quenching their thirst. liters of water per day is the minimum they need to consume. This water hall, as many others, also contains minerals that elephants can only find in such places. are not only places to drink, but also meeting points where solitary bulls can renew contact with the herd and maybe mate with females. This water hole was only used for drinking. With so much duckweed, it's not an appealing bath. Bathing is crucial to get rid of the lice that dig themselves into the creases of the skin. Both normal bathing or a mud bath are effective to kill off parasites. The mud here is not deep enough to wallow in. Never mind, a mud shower is better than nothing.
Spraying dust is another technique to get rid of the pests. For their hygiene, the buffalo rely on the service of a professional cleaner, the oxpecker bird, happy to find food with such ease. A guard in a strange uniform, the Senegal Jabiru, a cousin of the stork. Finding something to drink is a daily obsession for all creatures in the savanna. A male zebra has more chance of attracting females if he chooses an area near a water hole. However, the very fact that it attracts so many animals makes a water hole both a source of life and death. As often, the predators are lurking nearby. Grouping and standing together is the best defense strategy. Whatever happens, don't stray away or far from the herd. The hunters are just waiting for that. For once, the zebras panicked for nothing. The lions were just coming to drink. However, the zebra struggling in the mud close by is now at their mercy. The young male is also struggling to maneuver in the mud, but unfortunately for the zebra, he is less heavily handicapped by his weight. He could do with some help for the final kill, but the others seem reluctant to descend into the quagmire. Some of the young lions prefer play fighting for the time being. They don't have much time left for carefree activities. When they reach three, they will be expelled from the group, forced to fend for themselves and find elsewhere their own group of females.
When they play, fight, and bicker, these adolescents prepare for their future as a dominant male and a hunter. This play fighting develops their physical strength and responsiveness. While the pride is busy elsewhere, a lioness takes care of the cubs. This is one of their community's rules, never leave a cub alone. Usually, the lionesses have three or four cubs in each litter and spend as much time as possible with them until their second year. It is vital not only to educate them, but also to keep a close watch over them. 50% of the cubs die before the age of one, killed by hyenas and cheetahs. Whether her own or not, a lioness will breastfeed a cub. Each female in the pride is both mother, nanny, and godmother. The hyenas and other hunters of the savanna are not the only danger for the cubs. Other lions may be a threat. The young bachelor males wandering in search of a pride to take over are sometimes hungry and aggressive, and therefore dangerous. The babysitter knows it and remains vigilant. Even when he has already one or several partners, things are not easy for a male. Our lion is still trying to approach. However, he has made good progress and will hopefully shortly succeed. The first of some 200 copulations that will occur during their romance. From now on, there will be one every 15 minutes or so. The lioness suffers when the male withdraws. It is this pain and repeated copulations that trigger ovulation. But this does not make life easier for the male. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
prey, lionesses don't have as much patience as during the long naps when it's too hot even to move. Although, these naps always turn into endless play for the cubs. At this young age, playing is not just about having fun. With somersaults, tumbling, racing, chasing, the cubs learn to adjust their behavior and to control their movements. That's how they establish their hierarchical status, their codes, and everything that will govern their adult life. The dominant male is conspicuous by his absence in these family pictures. Indeed, he hardly takes care of the cub's education. He watches over them, but indirectly, by rejecting any intrusions of male strangers or predators in his territory. A leftover carcass a wildebeest already half devoured by a group of lions. The scavengers of the savanna take their seat. Once abandoned, a carcass is free to be devoured by any animal. The jackals have no more rights over it than the marabous. <coughs> Harassed by marabous, the jackals preferred to retreat but not without taking a magnificent trophy, the tail of the wildebeest. One of them eventually has some regrets. Why abandon such a nice prey? Why not come back for a second helping? It's all very well to play, but it doesn't fill up the stomach. And when there's no carcass to be found, what choice is there but to hunt?
Topi, like the wildebeest, know how to use their horns and hooves when it comes to defending their young. Is it really sensible to launch a solitary attack on a prey twice as large? It's clear more hunters should be involved, but where are the reinforcements? Here they are, but too late. All the herds are on alert. The three companions have known better days. They'll have to wait a bit longer before they can eat. The wildebeest are best known for the immense processions, marching towards their promised land. When a herd halts its march, it's for a good reason, love. Males aged at least three are seeking to gather around them as many females as possible. For this, they make great mad dashes and play fights just to attract attention. The excitement and nervousness of the wildebeest sometimes leads to odd behavior, as in the scene that follows. A baby, only a few hours old, is bullied by several adults. Do they want him to practice running, teaching him to flee or follow the herd without tripping up and to be ever ready? This is only a guess. Instinctively, the little wildebeest follows his mother like her shadow. He risks losing her if he strays too far from her, especially when the herd is moving. He would surely die on his own as no female would replace her. A mother wildebeest never nurtures another calf which is not hers. The wildebeest calf is the earliest to walk of all the herbivores. He has to be ready to embark without delay in this nomadic life. Only 10 minutes after birth, he's standing up and able to walk. Then he just tags along with the great collective movement, covering tens of thousands of kilometers per year, providing he overcomes the hazards. those who graze these grasslands, whether it be the dense herds of wildebeest or the less numerous topi and zebra, have to fear the great carnivores, all except the elephant. Our pride regularly taps into this abundance of prey, always aiming for the most vulnerable, babies, the elderly, and the infirm. The lionesses must have had a good meal recently, as hunting is not on their agenda. The mood is rather affectionate and playful. As they live quite old and spend a lot of time together looking after the youngsters, emotional relationships are essential to the lionesses. This is displayed through physical contact, with such strong ties in the pride, the lionesses may work together in rebuffing unwelcome males.
cubs have just discovered a highly enjoyable game that reminds us of something. act in the love story of our two heroes. Romeo comes to claim or propose yet another copulation. going down. It's not so hot and many animals have been waiting for this moment to go and drink. Around the lion's waterhole, everything seems to be slowing down, as if the fatigue of the day was felt by all of the animals. On this side of the waterhole, it is complete rest. Some understandably have succumbed to exhaustion. The curtain will soon fall on the grand scene of the Masai Mara, the end of a show every day replayed, where the eternal wanderers and experienced hunters live out their lives. Driven by the seasons, the struggle for survival of each creature maintains a balance. This balance is the secret of Africa's wild. 